Over 400 fans celebrated the 10th anniversary of the film Searching for Bobby Fischer at the Arclight Cinema in Hollywood. After the movie was shown, there was an in-depth interview with Oscar-winning screenwriter and director Steven Zalian and Emmy-nominated actor Joe Montaigne, who played the role of father to a seven-year-old chess prodigy. The moderator for this extraordinary event was James Jordan, screenplay consultant and owner of Candid Coverage. It's unsettling, isn't it? When you realize there are only so many things you can teach a child. And finally, they are who they are. I took Josh to the park today. Jeff. He played chess. He doesn't know how to play chess. He doesn't even tie his shoes. I'm playing chess with my dad. It's a game like Monopoly. In a world that thrives on competition. Why do you want your son to play chess? Oh, I don't. He does. He taught himself. In a game where winning means the world. Tell me, is the next Bobby Fischer somewhere in this room? <laughs> a challenge has begun. Your son creates like Fischer. He sees like him inside. If you're playing not to lose, Josh, you've got to risk losing. You've got to risk everything. I was wondering if you could keep him from playing their swords. No. You're gonna kill him not to play in the park. He loves it. Just makes my job harder. Then your job's harder. Ooh, good! Yeah, that's it. My son has a gift. He is better at this than I have ever been at anything in my life. You have to have contempt for your opponents. Because if you don't think it's a part of winning, you're wrong. Trick or treat. You have to hate them. But I don't. They hate you. They hate you, Josh. Get out of my house. To put a child in a position to care about winning and not to prepare him is wrong. The better I play, the better I have to play. That's just the way it works. Maybe it's better not to be the best. Josh, you in trouble. Don't move until you see it. He's not afraid of losing. He's afraid of losing your love. Sorry, Daddy, I can't see it. He knows you think he's weak, but he's not weak. He's decent. And if you or anyone else tries to beat that out of him, I swear to God, I'll take him away. Joe Montaigne, Lawrence Fishburne, Joan Allen, Max Pomerantz, and Ben Kingsley. Searching for Bobby Fischer. You're a much stronger player than I was at your age. My, my one watchword as an actor from the beginning of my career has been, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And for me, it was on the page. That's all I have to say, and I'll be glad to talk to you about this uh, when the film's over. Okay. Stephen, uh, what motivated you to adapt this particular book uh, into this film that was actually your directorial debut? Um, I, uh, first of all, I just want to say something first, because I hadn't said anything before, but I just want to I mean, for me, I think for Joe, too, to see so many people come out for this movie, like 10 years after it came out, is really something. So thanks for coming. Uh, th this, uh, this first came to me as uh, in the middle of a stack of stuff that um, Scott Reed had sent over. He's a producer, Scott Reed. He's always involved in 100 things. He sent over a stack of things, articles, books, things he was kind of interested in. And uh, this little book was one of them. And um, what uh, interested me to begin with was the photograph on the cover of the book, which was a picture uh, which is very much like a scene in the, in the film when, when uh, Josh is playing uh, Joe for the first time and he says, sitting low on the chessboard. It was a, it was a picture that looked like that. And um, 
then reading the book, I was I didn't know anything about chess, and and I was fascinated by every chapter in the book, which was a different as a different aspect of chess. One was like, you know, chess in Russia, chess in Washington Square, uh, kids' chess, that sort of thing, and. Um, I was just fascinated. I was fascinated with the idea of a kid being involved in a competition alone as opposed to being part of a team like baseball or basketball and what pressures that might put on. That was one of the uh, Joe, what made you decide to take this role in the movie? Well, for me, it was a no-brainer. I mean, as I, as I alluded to earlier about you know, being, a, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. You, you, when you're a young actor and you start out, you like to think that every script you read and everything you do is going to be brilliant and great. And there's all these millions of terrific roles out there to play over your lifetime. And uh, over the course of that lifetime, you start to realize it's, it's, it, it ain't so easy to find that stuff. And I remember distinctly, and we were just talking about it earlier, that I, I, I can remember like it was yesterday, sitting in, so I'm sitting in my bedroom reading, it was late at night, I was reading a script, there, a couple scripts I had at the time, and I, I read that one, and I got to the last page, and it was very late, it was about 11.30 at night. But luckily, I've, I've been with the same agent for almost 25 years, and so I, I know him well enough that I could call him at 11.30 at night. And I called him up and said, did you read this script? And he said, yeah. And I says, am I nuts, or is this one of the best things I've ever read. read. And he said, no, you're not nuts. I feel exactly the same way. So, as an actor, this is what we look for. Um, you don't always find it. There's always compromises. But in my mind, uh, if I had to li list, you know, certainly three of the best scripts that I've read in my life and certainly had the, the privilege to be in, this certainly would be one of them. Uh, your writing uh, and directing, you, you show so much authenticity, so much genuine uh, emotion. And, and I was wondering, uh, and, and so this writer and several of the questions alluded to this too, what is your process in creating that, that level of authenticity? Um, <clears throat> well, in the case of Bobby Fisher, I think uh, this also gets back to what you asked me before, which is what, what, why I was interested in it. Um, I mean, my one of my sons is eight years old. Was eight years old at the time, and so I was, you know, interested in that in the subject of, of uh, the idea of what is a parent's role, what is, you know, on a kid, what is a teacher's role, um, and you know what it takes to be a good parent. In uh, a lot of the scenes and a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the relationships in in, in the story are actually more about my family than the Waitskin family. Um, I saw a way of sort of, you know, being able to put some, some, of, some of our story into their story. And uh, how you do it, um, I, don't, I don't really know. I mean, people say, oh, well, you write what you know. I didn't know anything about chess. Uh, I knew about what I was going through at the time of being a, you know, fairly young parent and not quite knowing exactly what my, my role was. Um, and, and so it's an exploration. I mean, I think that one of the great things about writing is that, you know, you can explore something you don't know uh, a lot about, and you can hopefully learn and find and find, you know, find some authenticity in the process of actually developing the uh, the story. I still can't play chess, but I, you know, I, I, I I think I I know about the chess world, and I know about uh, you know really I think I think I hope I learned something about you know parenting from it too. Well, I talked to, uh, to chess players around the country when I worked at the Chess Federation, because I was working there at the time this movie came out. And the thing that came out from, from talking to people in the chess world was you actually captured it. Everyone assumed you were you know, a closet chess master yeah. because you captured that. And with Schindler's List and, and all of your writing, you seem to you know, inhabit the characters with, with a genuine uh, true, true, trueness. And well, I think the character—I mean, characters are characters. Characters are when I say they're the same. They're the same whether they're you know, you know, from you know pre-Christian times or or, or or the Middle Ages or now. I mean, people are people. So I think that that, that I don't worry about that. Um, in the case of Bobby Fischer, in terms of making him authentic for a chess player, that's not me. That's Bruce Pandolfini, who was our consultant. 
you know, I sat down with Bruce and, uh, you know, he explained, there was 44 scenes we figured out that ha actually had a chess position in, in it. And he worked out every single one of them. And um, we had kids who really knew how to play chess and honestly couldn't make a wrong move if, if you tried to get them to do it. They couldn't do it. It was just against their nature. And they would learn they would learn the games and the games would be very natural for them because they're the kind of things that they would do normally. So it's really, you know, credit to Bruce that the, uh, that the chess is accurate and uh, you know, and tells a story. He he you know, he was given certain limitations in the chess. For instance, the final game. There's a story going on in the final game that's that has to be reflected in the actual moves. And that, that was that was tough. It was tough to find or actually create a game. He didn't find that game. He, 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 Josh, and Fred actually created that game like three days before we shot it. 144 moves that answered sort of all of the plot things. Like right, Joe right. said, what happened? You know, why did he do that? I knew that was scripted. So, the, you know, he had to move his queen out at a certain exactly. time in the game. You know, that sort of thing. Exactly. Uh, Joe, uh, your performance, you have, you have such subtlety, such subtext, it's just, just amazing. Did, did this require a lot of preparation, or was it simply based on what you read on the page that you were able to turn in this performance? Yeah, I would have to say that it's, primarily it is based on what, what is on the page. I mean, for an actor, it's, it's like being a carpenter and, and, and given, they're giving you a beautiful set of tools that are well sharpened and everything is properly fits everything and everything works as, as opposed to just something that's just clumsy and not made well and being asked to you know, create something beautiful out of it. So it's, it, it, it's all there. It's just a matter of, of course, working with that ensemble. I mean, we were, we were laughing about it earlier. I mean, there was there were better actors saying no lines in this movie <laughs> <laughs> than you see doing lead roles in $50 million movies today. I mean, uh, I mean if, you, if you went through that, if you went through the credits, I would probably say there's about, since that movie was made, about 10 of those people have had Oscar nominations. And, and I mean, it's somebody like Tony Shalhoub who doesn't say a line, it's a juju bee. <laughs> <laughs> to William H. Macy being called the tuna fish father. <laughs> you just go down the line. Laura Linney, I mean, is the teacher. I mean, so it's, it's having this tremendous ensemble of, of, of actors, uh, a terrific script. Scott Rudin, who, who, who God bless him, is, um, has a reputation in this town as being a very tough producer. But when you are in one of his movies, you appreciate that kind of toughness because it's, it's that kind of a person who will insist on getting the best possible people for even the smallest little roles and to try to make something that 10 years later will still get a room full of people who will enjoy watching it. So, so uh, that's where it all comes from. Uh, Stephen, uh, do you always see the potential uh, emotional impact uh, to a story when you when you look at original material, or uh, do you create that you know at, after attacking the screenplay? I mean, I, I have to have a feeling for it, and I, I don't even have to be able to necessarily put it into words, but just have some sort of a feeling for it. I mean, I think that in the case of Bobby Fischer, I. You know, I had a feeling for that relationship. It was not unlike, you know, something in my own house, or so certainly something I could imagine. Then the trick is to then figure out, you know, the, me the mechanical process of how to bring that out. You know, part of it's inspiration, and part of it's just plotting through it. You know, and I, I don't have any. I, I could never teach a class on screenwriting because I don't really have a process that I use every time. I, you know. I kind of muddle through it each time and, and, and fight through it, really. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I, wish I, could, I wish I could say, well, you do this, 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 and this, and that's how it's done. But I don't do that, and I can't do it. Um, so, to answer your question, I, uh, to me, the most important thing to get me through the process, though, is a belief in what the thing is about and, a, and, and some sort of a connection to the, like, the personality of the story, the tone of the story. 
And if, I think that's, that must be true of an actor, too. If you understand how a person moves or sounds, that's half the battle. But you, you mentioned during dinner, which I was surprised, you said that you struggle with plot, and, and yet you're, you know, this movie is a perfect example of, of how, how intricate your, your plot is and the emotional journey that the characters are It was as if you were very much in control of the storytelling. <laughs> Just luck, I guess. Cause I, I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I look back on it, and I could sort of analyze it now, and, and we were talking about, well, you have this figure of <coughs> You know, this idea, and then on the other side you have this. And I look at it now and say, yeah, you're right, but I, I know I didn't have that in mind when I first started out. I mean, I, it, it, hopefully, I think, and I think that storytelling in general is, is something that, that's very natural, and it's not something that was invented or imposed. I mean, when you tell a story about anything, you tell a story about, you know, what happened to you on the way to the theater. You know, if something did happen to you, and if nothing happened to you, then there's no story. But if there's some drama at all, the way you tell that story, you know, is 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 a uh, is a traditional storytelling process. And I think that that's uh, whether we know it or not, we know how to tell a story. And, and how do we know? We see it every day. You know, I think our life is a story. You know, in a larger context. And whether it's a story you tell you know, when you get home or when you play or what. We're so used to kind of the structure of story that even without just you know figuring it out you know, as a formula, we do know it. And so we know we certainly know when it feels right. I know when a script isn't going right. I might I may not be able to articulate it, but I know I know when it's right when it's and in this early draft, it didn't change that much from, from the draft that I read to the shooting script, you change the principle to a t-shirt, mm -hmm. that type of thing, but the dialogue was much the same. And so you clearly, you know, were able to wrap yourself around the storytelling, you know, pretty early on. But what makes you decide to tinker with more drafts before you know you've got it right? I think, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time on the first draft, and, and uh, if I don't, I think with most, most scripts, if I get by 90% on the first draft or 95%, and then the rest is tinkering. It really is. Oh well, it would be, it would be better if it was a teacher rather than a principal. But, you know, it's, it, they're almost they're not arbitrary, but they're certain details. And um, so it's it, you know getting getting the. I mean, it's such a long process. Right? It, it starts with an idea, and then it gets a little more specific and sort of broken up into some sort of action, you know, two or three acts, and then characters, and it just starts getting more and more detailed as you go through. And in the first draft, I will get to about 90% of those details. And the rest of it will be dictated by shooting schedule or something that occurred to me after I finished that might be more interesting, you know, that sort of thing. But I know there's a lot of writers who just try to try to close the first draft and then figure they're going to do 10 rewrites. I don't do that. I try to, I try to nail it on, on the first time through. You know, when you're directing, when you know you're, you're going to direct the script, does that does that impact on how you're going to approach the writing versus if you're just writing the script? It really doesn't. I think when I was younger, I, I got away with stuff or thought I could get away with stuff. Meaning, I, I have no idea how I was going to shoot this. But all, you know, it sounds good when I want to write it out. You know, and that's and I'm just trying to please the reader, so I don't have to worry about that. And um, through, you know, from experience and seeing those movies made, I realized, like, <laughs> like Joe saying, it's not there. It's not going to be there. And you can't depend. The truth of the matter is a lot of times making a movie actually kind of compromises things that were, you know, ideas that you had in your head, uh, as opposed to uh, making them better, you know. So a lot of times something that's not good to be made is only going to be made worse when it when it's made. <laughs> and, uh, and, and um, so and the answer is no. I try to write it whether I'm directing it or not, that it's something that's on some actually and, uh, and I'm not relying on some kind of fake thing where I say in the description, you know, the character's really thinking this when he's saying that. And, uh, question for you. Uh, you seem to stick very closely to the script. How much? How much improvising on your part? 
in this particular case, there's very little improvising. There was no need, need for it. I mean, different writers and directors work differently. And I, as an actor, I respect that. I mean, my, my philosophy as, a, as an actor is to be, be a conduit for the words that the writer has created. In other words, if you're doing stuff that's, as Steve mentioned, if you're doing stuff that's just not there, it's not good, and uh, it forces you in some ways to try to you know, make something out of it. But if the material is there, if the writing is there, if it resonates in you as, a, as an actor, if you read it, then it's just your job to be that conduit, to translate, you know, the writer intended to you know, say, you know, make this point, point A. So now I have to take it, absorb it, flip it around through my head and then convey it to an audience and hopefully they get that point A that the writer intended. And that's going to take whatever spin it's going to take that, that, that as an actor I've, I've brought to it. But in this particular case, it was all pretty, pretty there. If there was any improv at all, it would have just been, most scripts have some degree of, you know, just a, you're changing a little something here and there. But as I recall, there was there was really no need for it. Uh, and but I have worked in situations where it's run the gamut from with Barry Levinson and a couple of films with Barry Levinson, and the way he, he wrote, the, uh, thinking of um, uh, Liberty Heights. There were many instances where he'd say, hey, "Let's just try something where you just kind of say say your own thing and put this in your own words and fool around with it." And you did, and, and a lot of times you use it. But that, that just, each, each director, writer is going to work differently. There's so much improvisation going on in between every line. Yeah. You know, that's where the improvisation right. is, which is the emotion you bring to it and the, you know, the ideas you bring to the character. The, 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 in many cases, the dialogue is incidental. You know, like for instance, the scene where you're doing the glove at the beginning. You know, and there's some dialogue there, but it's not important. Right. What's important is everything that's going on in that scene. But if the, the dialogue is the least important. Here. The thing is, if the dialogue is is is, is, is rings true to begin with, always stay with it. Sure. And that's what makes for the best improvisation. That you can. It's just like music. You can riff on something where, where the structure is already strong and is there. Then you can riff on it and you have something. But if you're if, if the structure is not there, if, if the basic stuff is not good, then you're then you're floundering a little bit. And then you're trying to create something that, that wasn't there. But, uh, so it's something like this, since the structure was all there, anything that you kind of, especially with the kind of actors that, that I was you know, had the pleasure to work with, it was very easy to be able to just, you know, to, 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 if you took any liberty at all, all it was was just little notions that would fit within the concept of, of the framework that Steve had already given. Well, yeah, some, sometimes you don't even need a dog as a Tony and the gummy bears. Right, sure. Uh, Powerful but that, that was probably described in some detail, you know, in terms of the, the action and what was happening probably within the minds of the characters in that, in that case, because that's all it was about. Right. But um, I think that, you know, this, this idea of improvisation is that uh, uh, how a character moves and how a character, you know, waits before they say a line, and that's, I mean, that's all improvisation. You know, that's all, all jazz. That's all... So, and so when people say improvisation, they usually just mean the lines. And to me, that's often the least important of everything that an actor does. And I think in the case of Bobby Fisher, we had these kids in a lot of the scenes who had never acted before. So, so what we were trying to do was to create as, as natural a setting as we could with you know, 50 people standing around so that they could, could almost believe that it was real. And that's when an actor like Joe and, and some of the other actors in the real pros, you know, how much they can help because they can kind of adapt to that, you know, you know do what needs to be done to bring out of a, a performance out of a, a kid who's never done it before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means, you know, you're off camera and you actually say something else in order to, you know, elicit a response, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it's tough, you know, it's, it's tough working with kids and animals. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's Spielberg said. Yeah. I'm James Jordan. Hope you enjoyed this video. For links to other videos and lots of free articles about screenwriting, please visit candidcoverage.com. Thank you for watching.